Welcome to this presentation where we attempt to try and put all the information together and give you some ideas of how you could construct parasite control programs in a meaningful manner. We say often that there are no one-size-fits-all programs for equine parasite control, which is true, but we also recognize that that's not very useful or very helpful for someone who's in the field and wants to know how should I do this. So what we try to do here is, is instead of giving you the final recipe uh, for parasite control, we give you the ingredients and then it's up to you to mix those ingredients in a meaningful manner uh, on the given farm and then construct the parasite control program. So there are general questions that we have to consider and here are just some of them that you have to take in mind and keep in mind when you uh, talk to the client. So climate obviously is important, uh, climate and seasonality, because that defines where and when we have the parasite transmission seasons and the grazing seasons and when horses are on pasture and when they're not. And those all uh, affect the parasite transmission patterns. So uh, looking at these outputs here, we have three different climates, uh, North Dakota uh, in the US on top and then Florida in the US in the middle and then uh, Palmerston North in New Zealand at the bottom. And the point is that, that, you know, these are just widely different. These illustrate the percent of the eggs that successfully developed to the infective L3 larva on pasture. And so that's highly driven by temperature and precipitation. So you can see in North Dakota, we have a distinct seasonality with an off season and an on season. The off season, it gets so cold that nothing develops. And then in the grazing season, the parasite transmission season, we do have a parasite infectivity. In contrast, in uh, St. Leo, Florida, no seasonality really almost at all. Uh, there's just conditions uh, present for parasite transmission year round. So what really matters here is, is when the horses are actually on pasture, uh, they could get infected year round. And then in Palmerston North, uh, Southern Hemisphere, we do have a winter summer pattern, but not nearly as, as long an off season in terms of parasite transmission, uh, if you compare to North Dakota on the top. So these things matter, they turn, they really play a role because we should, uh, we should really focus our, our efforts to control parasite, uh, um, parasite strong jowl egg shedding and ascarid egg shedding during the times of year where there is actually parasite transmission going on. Uh, we also need to take into account uh, the, the type of operation. Do we have a breeding farm with uh, young animals that changes the picture and the dynamic and the types of parasites present? Uh, whereas if we only have adult horses, it's a very different ball game. Pasture management obviously matters a lot and uh, all of these things that are mentioned here will affect parasite infectivity in various ways depending on how it's done with the time of year. And again, you can look at those charts and consider you know, certain times of year where parasite uh, transmission will be affected by these measures more than other times of year. Um, but parasite uh, pasture management, uh, mixed and alternate grazing with ruminants, which is practiced a lot in some countries, uh, including New Zealand, those are things that need to be taken into account. So if we break this down by age group and look at foals separately, uh, there are several things that really makes parasite control in foals very, very different. Uh, we have parasites that we don't find in adult horses. The epidemiology patterns of those parasites are very, very different. Uh, the first one that's given any consideration is Strongyloides westeri, the threat worm. This is a very unique parasite. It transmits uh, lactogenically through the milk from the mare to the foal, but it also transmits via the normal fecal oral route uh, and the larvae can uh, percutaneously uh, invade the host. So there are three routes of, of infection. Uh, furthermore, this parasite is the only parasite of horses that's capable of maintaining an entire life cycle in the environment without even entering 
a horse. So a given paddock, uh, a given yard um, can be uh, infested with the parasite and then when horses are turned out they can be infected through the percutaneous route or fecal oral route. And so that is widely different. We have very little evidence suggesting that this parasite is causing much in terms of health problems or disease, but there are uh, traditional regimens in place that many people use where they deworm the mares around foaling to prevent the transmission through the milk. There's actually no evidence to support that that makes any difference. We don't have studies evaluating whether a treatment, uh, given treatment will um, will impact the transmission of larvae through the milk. Uh, we don't know what the timing should be, the dose range uh, in terms relative to folding, what's the optimal time, uh, what's the optimal dose, what drug should we be treating with. We really don't have any information. Uh, we have very little information suggesting that the uh, parasite is causing disease in the very young foal, but uh, there are a couple papers suggesting that it could happen. So uh, the recommendations are not very firm. However, however, what we think is that certainly deworming a mare around foaling is not going to do any harm, uh, and, and it is possible that it could potentially affect transmission of this parasite. We don't recommend treating the foals for strongyloides at very young age. Um, so certainly if you want to do anything, uh, focus on the, on the folding mare. The primary parasite in foals is Parascris. Um, there is another presentation on how to use fecal egg counts here in this package where we talk about this pattern of Parascris egg shedding. We have the peak at about four months of age and then the egg counts uh, and worm burdens actually decline and disappear eventually and then the immune system has taken care of those parasites. So uh, this is the primary uh, health concern in foals. We know it can cause uh, various symptoms, including small intestinal impactions, which is a condition we would really uh, prefer to avoid. Um, we recommend as a baseline to treat all foals uh, at about two months of age. Younger than that is not meaningful because this parasite first migrates through liver and lungs, and we don't currently have any effective treatments against the migrating stages. So we have to wait until we have stages in the small intestine, which we can be sure to have at around two months of age. If we wait longer than two months, uh, so three or four months of age, these worm burdens will have grown larger and the worms will, ha will have grown larger in size and therefore, uh, potentially be uh, constituting a risk risk in terms of impaction. So we would right, like to target those parasites at a time where there is a decent number in the intestine, but there hasn't grown, uh, they haven't grown to be a large enough threat to uh, uh, potentially causing impaction when we deworm. So two months with a benzimidazole, and then a second treatment before weaning, uh, again, depending on when weaning is happening, uh, but uh, before the five-month age range is recommended to treat the ascrits a second time with an effective dewormer. Uh, and we'll get back to the, the effective dewormers uh, at the, towards the end of this presentation. Uh, egg counts are recommended to monitor the transition from ascrits to strongyles. Again, you can find more information uh, in the presentation about how to use fecal egg counts. Strongyles, um, the first treatment directed against strongyles is recommended at or just after weaning. Uh, before that, we really aren't really all that concerned about choosing drugs effective against strongyles, but after that age, strongyles are now the dominating parasite. And we also recommend to consider the first tra tapeworm treatment around this time as well, uh, certainly before the end of the first grazing season, because we have seen uh, tapeworm disease in weanlings and young yearlings. So shifting to yearlings, uh, yearlings again are a different ballpark, different ball game here. Uh, we are primarily dealing now with strongyles. We get very high strongyle egg counts normally in this age group. Uh, we don't see a particular seasonality uh, and we expect all the horses to be egg count positive. So we have to think about the infection pressure, the stocking density, where these horses are grazing, how long, uh, how we can, what we can do on those pastures uh, to mitigate the infection pressure in terms of some of the pasture management uh, tools that uh, I mentioned earlier. 
Also, we have to keep in mind that some of these young yearlings, as mentioned just before, can still have parascaris. We do sometimes see a reinfection with parascaris in the young yearling. And uh, because of drug resistance patterns, we are likely to need a different drug with a different mode of action uh, targeting ascarids. So again, an account is useful to monitor whether we should get some ascarids occurring in individual yearlings. And then certainly we recommend evaluating treatment efficacy. Again, in the fecal egg count uh, presentation, you can get more information about how to do that in a meaningful matter, manner. Tapeworms should be considered, uh, certainly in the climate like uh, New Zealand, tapeworms are likely to be present on every farm. And so we de really do need to consider treating for tapeworms. We typically recommend to do that towards the end of the grazing season um, where horses might have acquired tapeworm infections over the course of the grazing season. Uh, larvicidal treatments, i.e. treatments with efficacy against insisted cyathostome in larvae, are recommended for this age group. Again, in the uh, autumn, about uh, the uh, end of the grazing season, or going into the winter. But the seasonality and term in and when we should treat these yearlings will we really be dictated by the climatic patterns. And, and hence the infectivity, pasture infectivity patterns that I talked about in a previous slide. Mares or adult horses, if you will, um, again, we approach them very differently. Here, the egg counts are used to identify the consistent high shedders. We make sure that the consistent high shedders of horses are getting treated more frequently, more intensively than the majority of mares that are low or negative. So typically in a population of horses, uh, adult horses, we see half to maybe two thirds of the herd being below 200, 200 eggs per gram at any point in time. And we see this pattern being consistent over time. And so what we recommend is to strategically treat all horses twice a year, uh, spring and autumn. And the purpose here is to not really necessarily control the small strongyles because they're always going to be there, but we want to keep the large strongyles away. And we want to make sure that at least one of those two treatments, uh, ideally the one in the autumn, also includes an active uh, with efficacy against tapeworms. Then in addition to this foundation, uh, the twice per year foundation, we then use the fecal egg counts to identify horses in need of additional treatment. Those are the consistent high shedders. Typically, we would treat those in the middle of the grazing season. Depending on how long that grazing season is, we could even treat a high shedder uh, an additional time. So a high shedder might get up to four treatments in a year, depending on the duration of the grazing season, whereas a, no, a low or, or negative horse will only get two treatments. And again, in those that are account positive, it is important to evaluate treatment efficacy routinely. So what do we know in terms of current levels of resistance? This is what we have seen reported worldwide. There are reports from New Zealand as well. Uh, so just the three different anthelmintic drug classes that are labeled for use against nematode parasites, and then the three major nematode parasite groups in horses, the cyathostomas or small strongyles, the large strongyles, and then the ascarids. And so we have resistance reported to at least, uh, in at least one of the parasite groups to each and every drug class. So there is no drug class that's free of resistance. The pyrimidines, the pyrantel products have been used less in country, uh, countries like New Zealand and other Southern hemisphere countries. So we may see less resistance to this drug class uh, here compared to what we see on the no northern hemisphere where resistance in cyathostomas is, is very common. We have seen uh, evidence of macrocyclic lactone resistance in ascorts in, in New Zealand as well as el everywhere else in the world for that matter. And so um, the main thing, uh, main take home here is that um, we might still get effective drugs against each of the important parasites um, but not likely to get treatments that will work against all at the same time. So combination products may be one way to go about it, um, 
but certainly we still need to know what we're treating. So, so in, we could turn this around and say, so what can we say that each of these drug classes are still good for as far as we know? And, and that's summarized on this slide. So the benzimidazole drug class, we can count on them being effective against ascarids, against pinworm, oxyurus equi, and large drawn gels. Pyrimidines, i.e. Parentel products, uh, Morintel products in Australia. Um, again, ascarids, only a few cases of resistance have ever been reported. Um, in double dose, we have efficacy of uh, Parentel pamoid against tapeworm, Anaplocephala pafoliata and again, large strong gels. And then macrocyclic lactones, ivermectin, moxidectin, abomectin. Uh, we have efficacy against cyathostomans, albeit less than what we have seen uh, historically, but we still have efficacy. We have efficacy against bots, uh, bot larvae, gasterophilus uh, species, and then again, the large strong gels. One thing to notice about the efficacy against large strong gels that we have for all three drug classes is that one has to keep in mind that only the macrocyclic lactones will have efficacy in single dose uh, against migrating larvae. So, if you want any more information about all this, there is this very nice book that I uh, co-wrote with Craig Rademeyer in the US, and that provides much more detail about all you need to know for constructing meaningful parasite control programs. And so that's recommended for further reading.